Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, Powering a Sustainable Governance Program, Learnings and Best Practices from Eon Energy, sponsored today by Irwin. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen for that feature. And if you'd like to continue the conversation after the webinar, you can continue the networking at community.dataversity.net. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speakers for today, Romina Medici and Marianne McDonough. Romina is a pro the Program Manager for Data Management and Governance at E.ON. E.ON is a privately owned energy supplier and based in Essen, Germany with approximately 43,000 employees focused on energy networks, customer solutions, and renewables throughout the U.S., EMEA, and APJ. Romina began her 10-year career at E.ON as a procurement analyst and was promoted to analytics and optimization manager. In her current role, Romina is responsible for the implementation and support of data related and surrounding processes, technology, governance, people, and operational excellence in execution. Marianne has more than 30 years of business leadership experience and has led high performance teams through challenging business cycles to achieve sustainable growth and lasting impact. An expert in strategic growth, Marianne is currently the Chief Marketing Officer for Irwin, the data governance company, where she drives brand, demand, and product marketing. She was formerly CMO at SaaS Leader in Contact, where she helped drive stock value appreciation by 500% in five years. Marianne is an independent board member at Spark Post and holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Virginia. And with that, I will give the floor to Marianne and Romina to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hey, thanks, Shannon. It's um Awesome to be back on the Dataversity uh, virtual stage, and I just want to give you a shout out for being the coolest pre-webinar DJ in the business. Um, totally love the vibe that you set every time when we're hanging out and, and, and waiting, so, so thanks for that. Um, I'm completely excited to share um, Romina and Eon's story with you today, but just before we get started, I wanted to sh uh, just share a little bit of context. Nothing on this slide uh, is a surprise to any of the data ops professionals on this call. In fact, every uh, major enterprise customer that Irwin works with has the same exact problem, and that's data proliferating from everywhere. They don't know what data they have or where it is or who's using it. And one of the things that we find so interesting is that many of these really big enterprises grew up through M&A. And for those of us that have been involved in a lot of M&A in our careers, you know, we know that the last thing that usually is ever integrated deeply are data stores. So the question becomes, how can you leverage data to grow your business? Well, um, in uh, February, we did a study um, with our good friends at Dataversity here called the State of Data Governance 2.0. Um, this is our second uh, uh, of, of these uh, in the series. And what was really interesting is that respondents said that data governance initiatives in their business were being driven primarily by the need for better decision making. And the survey was done really just before COVID changed the landscape and business models around the world as people started to shift to you know, a new economy. So more than ever before, your company's data needs to inform every decision you make as you bet on the future path for your business. But what stands in the way of leveraging that data? That's one of the questions that we ask. And the answer really is automation. It takes too long to find the data we need. It's hard to say where it came from and how it was transformed along the way. And who knows how relevant that data actually is to the business. So, you know, our perspective at Irwin is you need to build an automated data pipeline that drives decision making through people, process, and obviously killer technology. Because, you know, at the end of the day, data readiness is everything. And it's everything because it powers everything you see below the line. So you want to improve digital experiences, have better, um, you know, person to person and, and, and virtual relationships with your customers. You want to make sure that you're spending less time in data preparation and more time in insights. Um, you want to drive digital innovation as people are looking to reinvent themselves in so many different ways in the current world. And then last but certainly not least is none of us can do it alone, especially in these in this day's economy. 
So being able to build digital ecosystems is really key. And data, data readiness really drives all of that. So we're going to turn it over to Romina now. And she's going to tell you all about Eon's journey with data readiness and all the amazing things that they did in 18 months, which for those of you who are sitting in the chair like Romina has is a really short period of time. Um, so I'm going to just click over. And Romina, I'm going to ask you to tell everybody a little bit about Eon Energy. Marianne, thank you very much for the handover. I'm uh, extremely pleased and happy to be here today and to share a bit of what we have been achieving, as you said, in 18 months. You already got a short introduction of uh, what E.ON actually is, or our company, or what we are about. Um, so I would like to add up just some things which are possibly not written on the line. First of all, E.ON has decided that we, as a company, we want to get digital. We want to be data driven, we want to be data focused, and everything that is written on the slide here to get a leading um, customer solutions provider to be the one who is basically implementing the smart grids um, is only possible if we really treat our data right and if we are getting digital. So there has been a decision by the board already now two years ago, uh, before I also started with my journey, that we want to have data management and governance as a focus, which was extremely impressive and I can tell one of the game changers in everything we are doing. So this is a very important thing. Now, besides me, um, I'm um, working on or responsible for data management and governance. We do have several, hundred, not hundred, but we have about 100, 120 people working just on data science, data engineering, data management and governance, and we are growing day by day. So I can tell that they were not making a promise only 24 months ago, but they set this also to life. And I'm very happy to have the possibility to at least give you an insight on the part that I am responsible for, which is data readiness. And uh, with this, I would basically jump into the next slide. So, what you maybe can imagine if you are working in data management and governance, or if you want to, this field is huge. It's huge and it's complex. And if you are then even talking about a company like E.ON, which is huge and complex, uh, it gets quite an interesting game, right? So at one point you have to start. And what we basically started with was to understand what are our challenges. So we really wanted to go to the core instead of just trying to, for example, start with any kind of discipline and, and just randomly start with something. We wanted to understand what is our core challenge and then from there start to derive what we want to do. Now, what you see here on the left-hand side are basically the core challenges uh, that we have been detecting at the point in time that we started, which was basically that we do have a very limited access to the data that we have. As you can imagine, we are a huge company. We have huge volumes of data, but none of them, or just very limited of them, are actually available for us to create value out of them. Now, the second one is that there was no overview about all the data sources that we had. We did not really have transparency on where the data is stored and how it looks like, and although we did not have transparency on who's responsible for it. So this is a challenge if you really want to become digital. Coming from these two points, your working with data is quite inefficient, right? You have to spend 80% of your time in just getting the data and trying to understand it, trying to get the data quality improved, and with this to really create value. So effectively, we have amazing people which are spending 80% of their day, time basically being frustrated because they cannot work with the data. And then another point that obviously for most of you will be also very relevant is the GDPR compliance. So we started shortly before GDPR has become into play and we are still working on improving ourselves and being more efficient and even better in handling the compliance of GDPR and to have GDPR as basically a key part of what we are doing in our daily business. And now last but not least, as we are coming from a very regulated business, 
and the grid business is basically regulated, as uh, you can imagine, because we belong to the fundamental needs of society. We have to be very careful with what we are doing with our data, because it can have an impact on you guys. If you don't have electricity anymore, because we are not protecting our data properly, this will create some struggles, right? So coming only from, from these five examples, and you can possibly imagine that the number has been growing over time of, of the challenges that we detected. We basically derived two work streams. The two work streams are technical data management, that's um, basically cataloging of data and understanding the schemas, and then data governance. So to set up a framework that does clarify responsibilities, put in policies, defines processes, and so on and so forth, to really make things happen and not just to talk about them. And the combination of the two is what we have been detecting in metadata management. So metadata management was basically the discipline that we decided to go for. And taking it from there, we got one step further that I will describe in the next slide, which is we had to find the right technology and the right partner to make all of this happen. And what we did was we started the journey of nine months. So we really took our time, I'm honest there, um, to talk about uh, or talk with 11 suppliers uh, in which we basically just got four on the short list and then two into a proof of concept. So the proof of concept was basically a real challenging one. It was not just you know testing functionalities, uh, we basically tested the, the technology that we were looking for in uh, a real life scenario. We connected our real sources and I mean challenging one like, like SAP, which are not easy to handle. And we solved real life problems. Any, every person which has been participating in the POC and these were coming from four countries had had a problem solved in the POC, right? And this is also what um, I will later talk about, was giving us a huge buy-in uh, for, for the later stages of the whole program. And um, based on this POC, we did evaluate technology, but we also evaluated partnership. We basically also looked into whom can we, or should we choose, uh, who does have the same commitment and same ambition um, of what we have, what you would see in a minute. Now, as we are a quite economical company, our whole decision was based on a total cost of ownership. That's what PCO means. Um, it, that's basically best practice for having anything that you want to judge quantified. So it's 100% price focus. And the four components that we have in this total cost of ownership were the license cost, I think, very straightforward, hosting cost, very straightforward, POC results, so basically the judgment of four countries and, and plus us. And last but not least, which was the most, let's say, challenging one, the cost of implementation. So we calculated already how much it will cost us to implement the technology. Now, as we have reviewed these four drivers of the total cost, we did the selection. And we basically, with this, made a very good choice uh, for our journey and we had the fundament ready um, to basically um, start off and uh, achieve what I'm going to show to you in a minute. And obviously, as you possibly can imagine, it was urban that we have chosen. <laughs> so, yeah, um, exactly. Having said this, I want to give you some numbers um, because this makes the whole thing a bit easier to understand and to understand the dimensions. But before I now go into the numbers, I would like to say that when I started this job two years and nine months ago, I just checked it today, there was nothing. And there was literally one person who was working with it, and that was me. <laughs> so quite a challenge for one person. Now, what you see here is what we achieved throughout the journey and mainly in the last 18 months. Let's start with the numbers and the effects and figures. So we did calculate only from 10 use cases, which is 
close to nothing if you think about a big company like E.ON, that we can derive a value of 8 million euros by implementing data management and governance. And uh, specifically here was a strong focus on metadata management and data governance. We did onboard 10 legal entities. And to make it clear, we are talking about onboarding 10 companies to the platform, legally independent companies, which all have a different culture, which all have a different mindset, which all have different processes, different organizations, different maturity, but they are all in. And we are actually very, very happy about that. We do have nine regional units, that's nine countries, which are having data quality initiatives ongoing. Um, and we do have in, uh, 67 systems uh, that we already have connected to our platform and where we do have full transparency on. Now, as I said, we started with one person, which was me. We are up to 169 at the moment, and we are actually growing day by day. So this is really something that we are also very proud of. And obviously, last but not least, uh, we just started to investigate into data modeling and data quality. And we also started to develop our first common data models, um, which are three at the moment. Besides these numbers, um, I would like to emphasize three additional points that I think have been game changers in the whole process. The first one is that we did implement a global team of experts, and I call really experts, so guys who really know exactly what they are talking about. And um, I'm basically responsible for, for this team. We also developed our own framework and assessment methodology to say on what maturity level our organizations are. This has two advantages. One is you can give them a very clear guidance. They can basically read the framework and they can just move ahead and they can just be successful. And secondly, you will be able to compare and you will be able to show them if they are progressing. And thus, you help them simply to know where they are and to move on. And then last but not least, uh, we developed a methodology uh, that is to calculate the value of data management and governance. I'm not sure how far you are in your journey, but I could imagine that you have been facing challenging uh, challenges to um, calculate the value of what you are doing. We have done the same or have had the same challenges, and we found out a methodology which allowed us to basically overcome these challenges. Now let's go one level deeper into the next um, area, which is uh, metadata management. So this is basically just one level deeper. Um, metadata management is in operation since beginning of 2019, so beginning of last year. As already mentioned, um, out of the 10 legal entities, eight of them are already using the platform. And they are coming from six different countries. So um, that was very fantastic that we had the chance to have their buy-in, and I can tell you what you maybe can imagine. Everyone who participated in the POC is now using the platform because they are convinced, because they were part of the decision-making process. Now, what is coming at the moment is we are onboarding new legal entities. Uh, we have another three in the pipeline that are currently onboarded to the platform. So this is not just a result. This is not the end point. This is the starting point. And it has been already quite uh, a good journey so far. Now, I already mentioned that we did have, or do have 67 cross systems connected. To give you some examples, um, those are covering technologies like SAP, like Microsoft Dynamics, like Snowflake, and also like uh, Salesforce. So also the core technologies that possibly one or the other of you is using as well. We did define 44 data domains. Um, I assume all of you know what it is, but still, a data domain is basically a cluster of data. It could be customer data, it could be billing data, and uh, we defined 44, uh, which are mainly driven by Romania. This is basically our flagship. And um, besides these data domains, we did train 175 users on the platform. Now, to give you a bit of a dimension, we are going to train the next 50 in the next three to four weeks. So again, this number is growing, and um, we are onboarding and training people day by day on this topic. And then we did also start to work on 
the semantic layer, so a common language, and we have defined 550 business terms that are in our platform and where everyone can have access to and uh, which are coming from various different data domains. What I would like to emphasize here, besides the numbers, is that we are also using metadata management as knowledge management. Because if you cover me or if you document metadata, you document knowledge of people. And if you start to understand this, it's extremely powerful. And the left down part on the slide, you basically see one example of um, the calculation logic of or, or basically documentation of KPIs and the management of KPIs. Um, in the middle, um, what you see is that we are not only, let's say, providing possibilities to use the platform, but we are also providing the possibility to understand how your usage and how your development is increasing. So we have a standard reporting and monitoring for all the different units that are using the platform. Now, what does this bring as an example, uh, as an advantage? They know where they are. They know if they achieve what they want to achieve. If not, they know where it's coming from. And they have something to go to and to show off to the board. And it's also used for basically showing off value. So it's very powerful. Then last but not least, and this also leads a bit into the next slide, we did develop an operating model that is um, basically um, defining how we are working together on the platform. And you will see more details here now. So metadata management is fascinating and cool, but it all doesn't work without the proper governance around it. So a key for implementing any discipline in data management is the governance around it. So to basically define some rules and framework for it. And this is what we did. We did the same. We started from the whole thing 18 months ago, together with the implementation with metadata management. We started very easy by just saying, we do have four common roles. These roles are aligned with all the legal entities we are talking with. And these roles are basically what we say is what you need if you want to get started. Not making it too complex, not making it too difficult. And now I jump one level down to the 50, where I say we have 50 people by now nominated and reallocated to these roles. So we have data owners, we have data stewards, we have local data, uh, data governance leads, and we have technical data stewards. So 50 people in the organization have been allocated to these roles and which are actively daily working on improving the management of data. And now I would like to, and to give you a bit of an idea on how these 50 people are split. Um, there we go to the left, where we have the 15, 15 business units, which are basically teams, uh, where the people are spread over. So 15 teams are basically having 50 people which are actively managing data every day. And besides those five countries that are actively already practicing data governance, we do have another three, and now we're in the top right corner, units that are having data governance as a top priority in 2020. And that means basically also here, the number of entities and the number of countries and the number of people is growing. So, and then last but not least, to basically bring all the words together, we do have an aligned data governance and data quality playbook, which is giving us a bit of more of a frame than just the roads. It's also a way of working. It's on processes, it's on policies. It basically helps us to bring all the different worlds together. Now, besides the numbers that I've just explained, we also have um, implemented various different processes um, and that um, we have um, needed. For example, as I said, we had a challenge in the beginning uh, to get access to data. So one of the first processes we implemented was how to get access to data and how to make data available. And if you imagine this kind of process, the next step was to say, okay, someone needs to feel responsible for giving access to data. And this is also, for example, how we derive the roles. We knew that the data owner is the absolute key role of everything we are doing. So the first step was uh, to understand what processes, policies, and so on we need. And the next step was then to define the roles. And the next step after this was to get people on the roles to gain access um, or 
provide access to the data. Just to give one example. Now, what we also did was to um, develop a very streamlined overview about um, how we measure ourselves overall. Now, I've mentioned that we started off with metadata management and data governance. As we have been reasonably developing quite well, we increased our field to having nine different work streams, which are, for example, also covering data modeling and data quality. And what you basically see here in the overview is, in the program overview, is the three major pillars and two key KPIs for each work stream that we are working with. So again, simple, but extremely effective and very easy to understand and to measure. And with this, we are basically able to steer an organization which holds at the moment around 170 people. So that's, that's very important. And then on the right-hand side, um, I had to share it because I really like the design and I don't know if my, uh, my, uh, my, my colleague Frank is in the call, but he did this and he's amazing. And um, this is basically our draft of a real book, a how-to book for data quality. And this is actually going to be printed and given to the people to simply understand why should they should call us now to start working on the quality of the data. Very simple, also a bit of marketing in there for sure, uh, but something that uh, is going to be very helpful in our development and in uh, also making people aware of what we are doing. So to summarize it all in all, we are really proud as E.ON of what we have achieved during the past um, 18 months and also actually three years that we have started to work on the topic. And I'm extremely much looking forward to the next 18 months. I cannot wait to see what we are going to deliver in those. And possibly I'm going to be back at that point in time to tell you all the crazy madness uh, that we have done through uh, that period of time. Crazy madness. You know, it's really interesting because um, this is not the first time I've seen your presentation clearly, but as I sit here and I reflect on all of the things that you've accomplished and the data to back it up, you know, the fact that you have all this reality about what you built, what, what there was before, what there is now, I think that, that you really have a tremendous level of expertise to share with the people who are listening. And it's been interesting to watch the questions flying around, so we'll get to those. Um, but what I wanted to do next was just between us girls, right? Talk a little bit about, you know, the tough questions. So you, you accomplished a lot and it was a really big undertaking. So I just want to break it down because so much of the time we talk about the technology and we don't necessarily talk as much about how the technology needs to get, you know, implemented and installed in the operating system of the business, right? So here's my first one. If you had to pick one thing, Romina, one thing, because I know that there are many, what do you think was the biggest challenge in, in undertaking the process? I think the biggest challenge was change management. That was the people, um, to, to convince them, to make them feel good, um, to make them get part of the journey. I think the factor of the people and, and the change management is something that is very, very often underestimated if you go into a let's say, in a project or program like this. Right. Yeah, that's something that we see. In fact, I said last week when you and I were rehearsing that we should get you a T-shirt that says change agents. Um, so uh, in follow up to that, I always wanted one myself. I have to have to tell you honestly. Um, follow up to that, technology or culture, which was more difficult? I pretty much think I know the answer. <laughs> yes. So definitely culture. I think technology is always something a bit logical and you can kind of understand it. Um, I love people, don't get me wrong. I love change, don't get me wrong. But the culture is something which is more complex and which is more diverse. Yeah, and so what, when, you, when you think about the culture piece of it, you know, let's break it down. You know, I think one of the things that you guys did a tremendous job about was you described in the POC, right, having you know, the four countries and, you know, a lot of different people engaged and involved so that, you know, when you brought the system on board, you know, it would be all good and people would start to adopt it. So tell me a little bit about that thinking. It's an investment that you take and it's a big investment. It's an investment in listening and understanding and communicating and in not stopping to do so. 
it's it's not a one time job. You don't talk and listen and understand the people once. You do it every day. So what we did was we really did not only incorporate them into our POC, for example, but we are talking to them every week and we are also listening to them every week. And out of the, what we hear, we try to really, really develop something. And this is basically, I think, an extremely good fundament for a very trustful relationship. So even if we fuck things up, and trust me, we did that. So we are not, you know, superheroes. We are a bit, but not enough. <laughs> so, but when you talk to people like this, and if you are such close to these people, then they are fine with also understanding that you are just a human and that you just do the best you can. Right, exactly. And, you know, I think one of the things that, that, that drove the way that you approach the culture, right, was the fact that, and we, we heard about it before, that the, that the board level, right, as, as Eon was looking at itself and looking at the transformation that it needed to have, um, that they drove a lot of this thinking that, you know, data has to be in the middle of everything that we do to change from a legacy, you know, power company to, to, to some new imagined, you know, version of, of the company that you are today. So can you just talk a little bit about that? Like, what was the communication like with senior executives? What was the cadence? You know, what kinds of things did you, did you guys give to them to see? You know, because obviously you continue to get tremendous support in terms of the growth and the expansion of the project, which is, I think, another incredible thing about this story, right? It didn't just end up in one little silo. So tell us how really that engagement at the senior level helped. So I can tell that maybe, or I not tell, but shortly explain a bit the structure of E.ON. So we do have one big board that I mentioned, uh, which is um, had the buy-in and support of what we did, but we do have several hundred legal entities. So that means we have one common board, but there are also sub boards in a way that have the full power about their legal entity. Now, that means that it was not enough to just convince one board. It was important we had to convince the board of each and every legal entity to really go and to really invest into the resources and into the topic. So um, the communication was always bottom up and top down. We had the full buy-in and backup of our um, chef, sorry, of our boss, um, Juan Moreno, who is responsible for um, data and analytics in general, he was going out and spreading the message like crazy. So this was top down convincing the board on his level. And on the other hand, we did have the people who were screaming for help, who were just you know, frustrated, which were not able to save the problems and that coming from top and from the bottom, there was almost no way of saying no and then take the 8 million euros into consideration. How can you say no to this? This is just from a rational perspective, as a senior manager, you cannot say no to something which is so valuable. Absolutely, and there's a lot of questions that people have around your, uh, your 8 million euro number, so we'll get to that. Um, again, picking one, and I know it's really hard. What was the biggest surprise? Like what, what is the thing that you learned that you never expected, you know, you would take away from this whole journey? I would literally say how complex the whole thing can get very fast. Um, and I remember when I started that everyone told me what you are trying to do is impossible. It's too complex. It's not manageable. And I was always just saying, you know, thank you for the motivation. I just got into this new role and I'm very happy that you are, you know, motivating me that much. And now it's, it's three years later, almost, if we remember when I started and I made it and the complexity was there. And yes, it was shocking <laughs> and they were right, but it was manageable. And I'm sometimes seriously speaking, still surprised if I listen to myself doing this presentation that we really did this. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. And, and obviously, they didn't know you well enough to know that. I don't know how you say throw the gauntlet down in German, but, but that was exactly what they did when they told you that it wasn't possible. So you've done big things, short period of time, lots of buy-in, lots of people engaged. Um, things are starting to hum along. What's the next big thing? Like, what are you guys going to tackle? 
in the remainder of this year into next year? And how, first of all, how far are you looking? Do you, how long term is your plan now? Is it an 18 month plan? Is it longer than that? Let's talk about that first. Um, so we do have a very um, easy way of, of planning in a way. So we have a hundred days plan always. Um, that's part of our company culture in the IT. Um, as we are working agile, so we are having 100 days plan and then we are breaking it down in sprints and then we are basically developing topics. Now, this is for my operational part. As you can imagine, I have various different um, kind of um, challenges. I have the operational part where we really do things. I have the technical part to really get people convinced and I have the strategic part because I have to decide where to allocate uh, my resources. Now, um, the strategic part is um, almost a never ending story. It's, I have a very strong vision um, that I want to achieve at a point in time and this can take us 10 years. Mm -hmm. And um, though I'm breaking it down into um, priorities, um, which are tactical um, to see where the biggest pain points are and uh, where to start with because the people are screaming the most and those who are scream are willing to work. Mm -hmm. And then from this we derive the 100 days basically. So what do you, what is the next big thing? I mean, what, how would you describe, you know, the next big hill for this project? That's data quality and data modeling, both of them, because okay. they interact with each other. So we want to investigate into this and we want to further um, build up capabilities. We are already quite knowledgeable. We are currently developing the technology around it. So these two are my next challenges I want to solve. Yeah, and one of the things that's interesting about you guys for Irwin as a, as a customer is a lot of our customers go from data modeling to data intelligence, and you guys are going from data intelligence to data modeling. So <laughs> it's just an interesting journey, but, you know, we love that. So tell me how much or has COVID changed any of your priorities or, or did new initiatives jump onto your plate over the past 12 weeks? Anything different there? Absolutely, yes, it's different. Um, we have been working already quite remotely beforehand because my team is spread all over um, Germany and the whole organization is spread all over 12 countries. So um, we have been working remotely, but we have been always in person persons. So we have been traveling a lot. We have been visiting the people. We have seen their faces. They have seen our faces and we always had a good drink together. So <laughs> um, that's just a joke, but we have been really close to the people. And especially um, because of that, we were afraid that we would rather slow down or all these new units would not really be getting part of the community because we cannot incorporate them as close and intense as we used to. That's really interesting. No, this didn't hold true. So we did make ourselves comfortable with the situation. We started to use tools like Mural to make really intense workshops. We really kept on communicating, we kept on being close to the people and we kept on being just with them. So I would say as people had time to think and as they possibly were a bit bored, <laughs> but they had time to think um, and to focus, we even got a higher priority than before, especially as now we were all depending on digitalization during the last two, 12 weeks. Yeah, that's a bit, I never really thought about the impact of the face to face and all of that um, and how how different it is to do a workshop like that when you're on the ground in Romania, right, versus being on, on, on the phone or on video. So it's good to know that it's translating for you guys um, for sure. So before we move into the um, the sort of final moments where we take some questions from the live studio audience and these guys are live. I love a data diversity audience. Um, what advice do you have for other people, right? So if you've got somebody who's listening right now and they are where you were 18 months ago and they're staring at a, a lot of chairs, you know, a lot of initiatives, some of them competing, you know, people that don't necessarily agree, a non-driven, non-data driven culture, what do you tell them about, you know, where they should start? I tell them what someone, I mean, I would have loved if someone would have told me, and this is don't hesitate. Don't be afraid. Um, have a vision. Know what you want. Know what you're talking about. So go into the details, understand the topics, and then go, walk, try it. Don't try to work months over months on a plan. 
follow a bit your instincts and watch, listen, and observe. So just never stop. And never even let the thought come to your mind that it's not possible, because it is. It's just a challenge. And, and always ask your vendor partners to do the impossible exactly. as well. <laughs> yes, that's absolutely true. This just is the commitment we did together 18 months ago that we will make this together. And I can tell we are really demanding and we would not have been able to achieve all of this without you. And well, look, one of the things that makes us special, I think, is that, you know, we believe in co-creation with our customers. Um, and so 100%. that's what this experience was for us. So thank you so much for that. I'm just going to finish up a little and then we're going to turn it over to Shannon and uh, you can start to take some of these great people's questions. So just to sort of round it all out, you heard Romina say all of this, but, you know, essentially the big thing is about building a data-driven culture, and that's certainly not an overnight 18-month, two-year. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a project, right? So, you know, one of the biggest things that you heard Romina talk about was time to value, right? She brought time to value to the organization as something for them to pay attention to, right? They could make decisions faster based on the data that she could provide them access to. So that was a really great way to get them completely built into what was going on. And then, you know, it's really also about making sure that, you know, there's company-wide data compliance. That's sort of a, you know, table stakes. But I think one of the biggest ones, and, you know, Romina talked a lot about this too, is that we got to demand insights based on data truth, right? For a long time, I would go to a board meeting and I would sit with my opposite member who is responsible for global sales, and we would have two different sets of numbers, right? In a data-driven culture, that can't happen. We all have to be making decisions based on the same, you know, the same insights, the same data, and be able to point to, you know, where it derived from. And then last but not least is, you know, what we're starting to call it at Irwin social data governance, right? So we got to be able to foster the collaboration across all of that to, you know, to, to keep this an ongoing project. I think one of the really exciting things about what Eon has done is they have built a business operating system and installed it effectively into their business. And it's something that's just gonna to continue to grow and not just be a monolith over time. Um, and that's great for the people who are you know, working for Eon. That's great for the people who are customers of Eon. It's great for people like us who are vendor partners of Eon as well. So just a couple of things to say, hey, take a look at. I talked to you about the state of governance and data automation um, report that we did. Uh, earlier, and we'll send you out some links to that and lots of other really great content, uh, visit Irwin.com. And we also will be uh, participating in Dataversity's Demo Day coming up on uh, July the 29th. So I am going to now turn it over to Shannon. Thank you both so much, uh, and thank you for this great presentation, Romina. You, uh, you, Romina, you just you definitely have some fans out there in what you guys have done and accomplished. Uh, and just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording and anything else requested throughout here. So uh, diving in, you know. Um, and, and maybe you covered some of these questions already a little bit, but uh, just want to ask it a little different way and a little, uh, and, and maybe a little different answer. You know, what are the challenges of rationalizing the business terms from the different legal entities? Um, so let's say before we basically took on the challenge of rationalizing, then we asked the people to think in their own world and to think in their own language. Um, which was basically saying they were just creating the business terms however they wish to. Uh, we gave them a bit of uh, kind of standards and frames, you know, what we want to know and what they should define for it. But in the end of the day, the creation was in the first step very free and really creative. Now, at the moment in time that the first two, three hundred were created, we didn't even have to like really convince them because they were realizing that they um, created the uh, business term for address about 15 times. They created the term for customer about 15 times. So it was really like, you know, um, obvious uh, that there is a harmonization needed. Um, so um, what we basically did was we left the field and we said it's a green field, go for it. And then whenever we realized that some business terms are very similar or they are just repetitive, uh, we started to create global business terms out of these. So that basically means that 
um, throughout the work together with the unit, we had a differentiation between local and global business terms, which have always been aligned with the units directly. Um, now, looking further down the road, uh, when we will have even more people working on the topics, we are going to also implement the Data Governance Council and the Data Governance Board. And the Data Governance Council is basically going to bring all these people together and uh, make them discuss about the specific business terms. So it's going to be part of the work of them. And the participants in this council, I think this is going to be one of the questions which would come afterwards, are going to be the data owners. And mm -hmm. the data owners are creating the business terms and then they can discuss together with other owners which have the same data domains as, as a base and uh, basically also align on common definitions for the business terms. So Romina, how will they all um, interact with each other? How, how do you perceive that, that going? Is that something that you'll do some sort of a virtual conference on a quarterly basis, plus it'll be addressed in daily workflow. What, what's the vision for that? Um, so basically the single point of truth for everything is urban platform. Um, this is where all the business terms are already checked by now and they are going to remain there. Um, the whole interaction and collaboration can be done through the platform. So you can um, basically on a business term level start a chat with the data owner who is directly allocated to the business term um, and basically to the discussion there. If there are conflicts coming up, um, then these are going to be brought to our team, so to the global team, and this is going to raise them to the Data Governance Council. The Data Governance Council is in the, first, in the beginning only going to take place every possibly other month, but we do not have it implemented yet, so it might change. And uh, obviously it's going to be a conference because we have people from, um, at that point in time, possibly nine to 10 countries participating. Fabulous. So how have you measured the impact on business of all this implementation? Um, so if you look into data management and governance, it is hardly possible to derive a direct impact on the EBITDA and on the PNL. So this is a common challenge. Um, what we did was to still look into um, impact through cost reductions. That's basically um, by reducing storage costs, by uh, reducing costs um, for um, data quality corrections by people, by reducing costs of external suppliers who are doing jobs for us. So this is direct cost impact, PNL. Then uh, we do have a principle um, in E.ON which is called operational excellence. And this is basically stating that you should work as a leader day by day on making your people more efficient. And there's a common way of calculating it. And we are using this productivity increases also as part of um, the impact value, uh, so value calculation, that's only value then. And um, another possibility is the uh, avoidance um, of fees for um, GDPR in compliance, uh, which could be also used, uh, again, value calculation. So. And these are just three of um, what we use to measure the impact. I love it. So what are some of the challenges you came across specifically for establishing data quality framework and how have you overcome them? There are still always challenges. <laughs> it never stops. Um, okay, for data quality actually wasn't the biggest challenge. If you look into data quality as data governance and data quality is a sub point of data governance, then it's more challenging. But I assume you look into data quality management only. Um, a lot of challenges that you find in the business are coming from data quality issues. Let's take the following example. You want to contact your customers through email instead of letters. Um, if you don't have the email address or the email address is incorrect, you cannot contact them via letter, and thus, as a logical consequence, you cannot save the money that you would want to save by changing from letter to email. That's a very simple example, which makes it very easy for us to um, convince people to work on their data quality. Now, if you make this a little more abstract, that means you simply do data quality based on issues, not because it should be done. So, you basically say that um, you take a concrete challenge in the business that is based on data quality, and then you start to uh, work on the topic. So, Romina, let me just toss in there for a second, because that was a really interesting way that you put that, is you take a business challenge and then you, you, you address it with data quality. I mean, that's very much one of the things I think that makes 
your approach to this project different, right? In general, because you guys didn't just develop some esoteric concept about how data governance should work. You know, as you talked about before, and I want to call your attention to the fact that, you know, you started out with 10 use cases, right? And that was just the tip of the iceberg. And those use cases were, were derived in the, the, the impediments that people had to being able to use data in the business every day, right? So I think that that's a different way of looking at things and probably one of the reasons why you got so far so fast. I would 100% agree on that. We, go, we went mainly bottom up. We always started on a use case base. We did never try to just force people into a framework. We always solved their problems with what we were doing. And I think this is a crucial, crucial, crucial point in being successful in this. That's also where I fully agree with what you just said, Marianne. Yeah, interesting. Back to you. <laughs> I love it, and, it's, and I agree. So what was the size of your data governance implementation team, and what were the roles of the team? Um, so this is, has changed over the last 18 months. I started alone, then I got one person who was basically my technical heart. He was amazing, um, an architect, which was very, very strong from a technical perspective. Um, so to um, summarize it, not to go through each person, we were growing constantly. And uh, we were, after the first three months, we were two people. After the following 12 months, we were five. And um, in the implementation phase itself, uh, we were nine. And we are still growing. And um, sorry, for the roads, I always employed experts. So I had uh, one expert for data governance, one expert for metadata management. I even stole one expert from Urban. <laughs> um, we had an expert for um, architecture, as I said, and then um, data quality is now the latest one that we um, got into the team. <laughs> Love it. So uh, what was your principal reference to build your framework? Um, so the framework is based on um, research um, based on the Gartner um, Information Mat um, Management Maturity Model, the Stanford uh, Data Governance Maturity Model, and the Dharma Data Management Maturity Model. Um, these were basically the ones uh, that we have analyzed in more detail, and then we took about 78 books. I uh, can give you a list of references uh, as a base for the development of our own framework, uh, which were from, and not only data management books, it was um, a lot of change management. Um, it was about um, IT visions and strategy. It was a lot of different sources, but obviously, as you can imagine, major ones were um, from the field of data management and governance. So I have a question about that, Romina, because I know that um, one of the really great things that we co-created with you guys is the flexible meta model that our Urban Data Intelligence Platform runs on. But why did you make a decision not to just say, you know, we'll use the Stanford frame, for example? Why, why did you decide to triangulate them and then create your own? <laughs> no, why? Because we always want to be in the lead. Uh, no, actually we do it and we, we create our own things because we really want to make a difference. And to be able to make a difference, you need to be flexible. That's what the new meta model is allowing us to this end to end relationships instead of uh, being a bit more static. And um, we really want to dig deep and um, we really want to understand what we are talking about. So even if we would have taken just one of the standards model of the market, it, we would have still invested the time to really understand all the context around it. And for the meta model specifically, um, it was allowing us to do knowledge management and not just metadata management. And when we were looking into the topics and we were having these discussions and we were incorporating all the feedback from our units, they were all screaming for a flexible meta model. So it's not only us, it was Eon, everyone who was participating in this journey, who was basically wanting um, and us to, um, to, to change. So uh, talking more about the analytics again, you know, is the KPI in this solution for data governance only for the entire enterprise scorecard? Um, sorry, I'm just checking the question again. Yeah, so, so ah, the, the guys, got it. Yeah. No, no, it's fine. I, I just had to read it again. Sorry, I have to, I have to add Q&A often. Anyway, um, there, this KPI, 
I, and I assume that you mean the 8 million, are covering all the different disciplines, but uh, the use cases were mainly coming from um, metadata management, data governance, um, and um, a lot also on sensitive data discovery, which is basically GDPR compliance. So um, that was uh, the major drivers. So um, yeah, it is covering more than just data governance. Yeah, but so for are you measuring are those those analytics that you're measuring and for the data governance success are are they enterprise wide only enterprise wide or are you looking at individual groups or organizations or mm, so they are as they are based on use cases the value calculation is valid per unit which has provided this calculation so um, the calculation method is what we developed to feed it with content is what the business did. So every number in this 8 million is based on a concrete use case that has been formulated and calculated together with us uh, in the business. So it's spread over the enterprise. And, and really they were a multiplicity of, of groups and, and, uh, and countries, right? Country operations um, that work together on, on that original stuff. So it was definitely you know, beyond just a centralized group, it had really spread into the business. Yeah, absolutely. And we did this interactively. So we calculate the value uh, or we start off everything with value workshop uh, where we basically get into the talking with people and um, we really do it together with them. We don't do it ourselves. Everything that we calculated is signed off by them because they have been part of the calculation and we have talked to the people. So how do you face roles definition challenges? By allowing a bit of flexibility. <laughs> um, so let's say, let's take the role data owner. No one wants to take responsibility for data. Everyone is scared of it, especially if you want to make them responsible for data quality because they always think it's too much work. I cannot handle it. I don't have any clue how to improve my data quality. I don't want to do it. I don't care. Now, this is um, typical and this is completely human because it's a matter of change and we all know from change management that it's normal that people are scared. So um, by talking to people, by um, I'm saying this very often, but I truly mean it, listen, talk, convince them and help them define what it means. Show them that it's only 10% of the working time. Let's say we took the first data owners. We did a huge kickoff with them. Where, for example, Urban was all participating. We were spending two days just to show them what they shall do in the future in the daily job. So we really onboarded them very closely. We showed them the job. We showed them how to create business terms. We gave them like, you know, um, the guidance. And we had a local data governance lead who was amazing, who was helping them throughout day by day. Uh, we have our experts in my team, which are always people that you can reach out to. Um, we are every week talking to them still. So, yeah. How do you define roles by making them happen and by making people feel comfortable being in this role? And then the definition almost doesn't matter any longer. Very impressive. And I think we have time to slip in one more question here. Um, how did you go about defining agreed upon data domain and identify their quote unquote data owner? Um, so again here, green, um, Greenfield, um, the guys in the units can always decide by themselves how they want to um, spread the data domains. Usually they found this really challenging. Um, they don't know where to start and where to end. Now, uh, and what is also the case is that um, a data asset, a concrete one, technical one, can actually be allocated to more than one data domain because it's used in various different um, processes in the organization now. So um, it's not easy, um, but usually it's very easy to um, basically start it off from looking into the business unit. So how is your organization structured? How are your teams structured? And uh, usually you might have a team which is responsible for customer contacts and you might going to have a team which is responsible for all the billing and um, for, for the, uh, for the um, processes behind that. And then step by step, you start to make people simply responsible for what they are working with every day. And um, so basically, in the data domains, we didn't harmonize them. Uh, we just left them quite local. And we basically left them in the um, structure that fits into the organization with the major reason that we wanted to make people only responsible for what they are actually really working with. 
and uh, that they do not have to spend their whole day just talking to other people to do what they want, which is impossible if they are not just directly working with you or for you. So um, that was basically um, the way we did it. It was quite business focused how the data domains have been developed. And um, how to find the data owner, um, the team lead <laughs> made it quite simple. Um, but there might be about 500 different ways of doing it. So I wouldn't say that this is the only way. I would just say that this is the way we basically went through uh, for, for uh, our flagship in Romania. Um, and we basically um, encourage all the other organizations to go for the same approach. And uh, they are also basically all running into the same direction there. Well, Romina and Marianne, thank you so much for, again, for this fantastic uh, presentation and information. It's just been very valuable. Again, you got a lot of fans out there who are uh, soaking in everything that you've been talking about. Um, and thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything that we would do, but I'm afraid that is all the time that we have for today. Again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by the end of day Thursday with links to the slides and links to the recording of this presentation. Again, thank you all so much. Hope you all stay safe out there. Marianne and Romina, again, thank you. Hope you guys have a great day. Thanks, Romina. Bye, everybody. Thank you for your time.